Francisco Native, who's born and raised here in the mission. He's, a, he's passionate about marine biology, social justice, uh, as well as environmental sciences. Uh, he regularly works on cleanup initiatives at beaches and parks around the city and volunteers at the Marine Mammal Center when he can. Uh, he's also part of the Green Academy and the Youth vs. Apocalypse at his uh, the Youth vs. Apocalypse Club at his school, uh, and recently joined the Youth Justice Collective through the Community Youth Center of San Francisco. Please welcome to you. We have Carly here in the middle. Uh, Carly is a junior and part of the Law Academy at her high school. She is a, she's passionate about social justice, land back initiatives, and immigration law. She currently works uh, at the local community farm, the Hummingbird Farm, through Padere Asset. And Carly believes that the key to solving the climate crisis is decolonization. <laughs> and then uh, Kelly Rock is a librettist, translator, and dramaturg. Her work has been commissioned and performed by the Metropolitan Opera, the English National Opera, Royal Opera House, Washington National Opera, Clem and Glass, just to name a few of the amazing companies that, uh, that she works with. Um, and of course, Opera Parallel. <laughs> uh, Kelly uh, was a founding editor of Opera Magazine and is resident dramaturg for the Glimmer Glass Festival, as well as an artistic advisor for Washington National Opera's American Opera Initiative. So please welcome the Austria Channel for Catherine. You're both doing amazing work related to climate justice. Um, and I wonder if we could just start with each of you telling us a little bit about um, your passion, your main avenue for activism, uh, how you got started doing that. So, Kelly, since you're holding the mic, you can start. I'm not sure if people um, know Poder uh, SF. It's basically. Um, it's working in the Excelsior with the Latino community. Um, one of its main focuses is providing ways to decolonize your diet, um, free food for the people. So I work at a community garden um, right by Crocker Amazon. And all of you guys should go if you can. <laughs> they have community service hours and um, volunteer hours. But basically our initiative is to uh, create a place by the people, for the people, where we can farm, um, learn indigenous medicines, uh, re like rehabilitate the land, and just feed our people. That's awesome. So can you break out a little bit more, like when you say decolonize your diet? Tell me about what that means. So um, in a lot of marginalized communities, it's common that the foods that were uh, provided are processed, and that's just kind of what we have. Like if you look at low-income neighborhoods, there's more McDonald's than in higher-income neighborhoods. So when we're talking about decolonizing our diet, we're talking about giving marginalized groups access to healthy food instead of the processed foods that were offered. Awesome. You want to pass the mic, Eddie? Tell us a little bit about your work. Hi. Um, a lot of my work is centered around volunteering or showing up to things. I'm currently not working with a specific organization like Cali, but I've recently been really focused on social justice with showing up to multiple different protests, but a lot of my work is going to different things that I see, such as beach cleanups or other activist groups, and I think it's really important to show up to these things because the more people that we get, the more, pe the more effect that we can have. So a lot of times, if you kind of blanking here, sorry. A lot of times, if you go, the effect and the people you meet can have a really profound, it had a really profound effect on me, and I've gone to multiple different things, like I've been with Poder a lot, which is really cool. I've also worked with Enterprise for Youth working on climate, um, habitat restoration at Heron's Head Park, which is really cool, and yeah. What I love about this already is, is just seeing the different strategies, right? Like one strategy is I'm going to embed in one organization and, and, and focus on that. And another is, um, as you say, just showing up, you know, and, and, and being in as many places as one. So that's, that's awesome. Um, Kali, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, a lot of your work um, centers around indigenous rights. 
talk a little bit more about the intersectionality of climate change and decolonization. Of course. So if we look at the beginning of our mistreatment of the environment, it directly correlates with colonization and that timeline. So it's important to create a connection in our conversations with decolonizing and um, creating a better planet for future generations. The way that indigenous people have stewarded the land has always been in a caretaking way, unlike the way that a lot of um, industrialization has kind of taken advantage of the land and mistreated it. So I think the key to achieving a just better future is by looking into our past, looking at what the indigenous people have done to the land, how they've caretaked it, how they've survived off of it without hurting it. And the only way forward is to look back and watch those patterns and see those differences and, and see how that worked for them and how we can all achieve a lifestyle where we're comfortable without harming the land the way we do. Um, so Eddie, I understand you're born and raised in the mission and you're involved in many projects and actions around here. Um, you know, it's so, the problem of what's going on in the environment is so overwhelming, and also the various ways to get involved, it, it, it can be overwhelming. So for someone who says, like, how, how do I get started? What do I do? And what suggestions would you have for people? I think everyone has their own path. A lot of times there's different ways you can help out. For me personally, I found that through showing up and being there, but a lot of times different people, they either share it to others who can show up or they donate monetarily if that's what they can do. And for being able to be there or find, getting involved in that kind of thing, it's really just knowing people in that area. And if you don't, maybe go <coughs> see, if you see something such as a beach cleanup or a community event, you're gonna find people there that are like-minded about these kinds of issues that you can continue to grow and learn alongside, as I have, that will show you, and I've learned a lot from elders in the community who have had these ideas before and have been working on implementing them, but need fresh energy or fresh people and fresh minds to bring in new ideas to help the environment. And a lot of times it can be discouraging because you see all these massive corporations that are constantly working against or not really helping a lot in the environment. You're, for me personally, I'm always seeing on the news, there was a massive oil spill or there was this and this, and it can be really psychologically damaging because you're like, how is my little thing going to affect or going to change this? But if we all work together, we can all have a massive impact. Yeah, so I also wanted to add on, um, it's so important that we do things like, the small things that we do, like recycling, composting, you know, using reusable water bottles. And it's also important that we start working together to hold corporations accountable for the biggest part that they play in this issue. They want, to, they want us to feel like it's our fault what's happening in the world, but really they're the ones contributing the most to the issues in the world. So I think it's really important if we want to make an actual difference we need to start mobilizing, we need to start growing numbers, educating people about the amount that corporations add to the waste in the world. And if we do that, we can create a difference. If we hold them accountable, we can create a difference. And I feel like that might be our only path to actually switching things around for future generations. Because I, I think what you're talking about, speaking out, and this ties to you know the opening of the show, tell it, telling stories, whether it's telling the truth about what's happening or um, you know sort of more metaphorical things like this. And I'm just curious, and maybe this is not a fair question. Um, you have seen what's happening in the world that you live in, and you've, you've chosen different ways of coming at that. Um, you've spent the evening in this fictional, but not that unimaginable 
whole world of the emissary. Um, so bringing all of your tools um, and passion as an activist, if you found yourself in this world, um, what might you do? Okay, so I think my first step, what I noticed, and I think what we all noticed, was when there was something that was like a real issue, instead of like naming it, we would see those people with the sunglasses coming out. <laughs> I think the first step to change is education. So I would make sure that everybody knew what those special circumstances were. <laughs> and that would probably definitely inspire something in people. I mean, yeah, what would you do? <laughs> um, I think I had a really similar idea to yours, education, but also really looking at the issue and looking at ways you can change it yourself, even if just by a small amount, like talking about it with your friends or something like that. But if I was also there, I think this is a fictional world, so it's hard to say. But what else could I do? <laughs> I think I would all do you also just have to find ways to invest your money or things like that to do something that can create a difference. Maybe if that's just planning like a, a small community garden, something like that that could bring about this change. There's, um, you know, there's this shadowy group, the, the Emissary Association, and they're, they're a little bit mysterious in the novel, and we wanted to keep that, the mystery um, in the opera. But from what you can tell about their strategy, what do you think about their idea of change, and do you have any advice for them? Like I said, I mean, I think that they're trying something, and I think it's smart um, what they're doing, but I definitely think it's a common mistake that people make where they decide not to educate the masses about real issues. And I mean, we all deserve to know what's going on. Like, we shouldn't have things hidden. So I would say to the emissary, if you want to make actual difference, if you want to inspire your people, bring forward the full truth. Because that's the only way to make change. I don't really know how to follow that one. <laughs> Kind of echoing that, really bringing everything that is everything to light and showing the full issue, but also bringing evidence, photos, things like that, bringing things that make people feel to try to change. And yeah, you basically said everything. I'm sorry for thinking. <laughs> Do we have um, questions from the audience for our wonderful panelists? Yeah. So, what was your first inspiration to show up? What and made you take the first step? So the question was, what was your first inspiration to show up? What made you take the first step? I think my first inspiration was actually my mother, who I grew up going to protests and other things like that with her. And even though she didn't have a lot of time to show up to these kind of things, she always made sure that even in her busy schedule, she could show up. And I really wanted to copy that and show that and do what I could to make a change. How old were you when you went to your first um, action of some kind? Technically, while I was still in school. But <laughs> when I think I was around the age of four or five. But then my first like individual one that I chose to go to myself was around the age of 10 or 11, I think. Do you remember the one when you were four? <laughs> um, kind of. It was a protest against the bombs that were being dropped. Mm -hmm. The Middle East, but yeah. And how much of that were you able to grasp? Like, was did your mom talk to you about like these big issues as a four-year-old? Like, how did that work? I well, they were simplified down to what yes. I could think of, but <laughs> I could grasp some of it in what terms I could put it into with children's books and reference. But I think it really helped that they were explained to me instead of somebody thinking, "Oh, you're a little kid, you won't grasp these things," because a lot of times. People look at kids or teenagers like us and they're like, oh, these are too complicated of an issue. You don't really understand the full picture. But if you take the time to really think about it, to really try to explain it to somebody else, it can have a really massive effect. And that person can get it, and they can continue on the work. Other questions? a way to make an environmental difference, 
there's a brand new innovative foundation called the Sierra Nevada Foundation. You could Google it tomorrow and look at that. Look at that website. The people have made a huge difference. So for those who weren't able to hear that, this was a recommendation to check out the Sierra Nevada Foundation that's doing a lot of good work um, and Google their website. Thank you for that recommendation. Yes? Um, I have a question for you. Uh, because I think this was such a remarkable novelty that and the fact that it speaks to these two fabulous young people, I think is very, very powerful. So I'm wondering about Amazing composer, and also you. Why you? You guys had a lot of choices of what you could pick, and you chose this. And I'm just so curious. So this is a question about why choose the emissary. Can you come on down here? Um, it was actually Kenji who chose the story, so I'm going to hand it over to him. Uh. It was hard. I was having a hard time to pick subject after get, get, I got this commission, and uh, he sent me a list of <laughs> climate <laughs> fiction novels, and the emissary was on the list. And actually, the Japanese original version Kentoshi was on my reading list. That reading list that oh, I don't know. With this force, and it was, I thought it was perfect for Angela mm -hmm. Opera, and he said, yeah, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and when the folks at OP called me and, and said, listen to Kenji's music, read this novel, I was very excited. I, I mean, I think this is, it's the issue of our time, right? That, that there are so many things that we could be thinking about, and it's overwhelming. And I, a very wise person said to me, you know, pick one cause and pour your energy there. And, and for me, that's first and foremost, is, is caring for the world that we live in, the water we drink and the air we breathe and, and the land. Um, so to be asked to write an opera that has an environmental theme and with Kenji's beautiful music was extremely exciting. Um, other questions now for anyone up here? Yes? And I just have a follow-up, because I'm curious how many authors the two of you have attended prior to this one. How many operas have you attended prior to this one? <laughs> well, I've attended a lot of plays before since my family's in the mime troupe. Oh, but okay. operas, <laughs> that many. I think this is like my second or third one, somewhere around there. Um, this is the only opera I've ever been to. <laughs> Hopefully not the last. <laughs> it won't be. I Excellent. Think, I think though it shows the power of your work and the brilliance of your choice. Mm -hmm. that, that these two friends, you know, amazing young people are here experiencing it and talking about how it uh, relates to their own experience. Yeah, well we're we're so happy to have like I I'm walking away inspired just by your work and your passion. Nicole, did I see you raise your hand? Well I was going to ask yeah, your first opera? Will you go back to opera? Do you think opera is a good thing? My mom, my mom told me this isn't like other operas. It's better. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll go to another one from here. Right. But you know, it's, it's interesting. I think we all have this perceived idea of what opera is, which is a, you know, hundreds of year old from Europe. And the thing is, like, this opera is not unique in that it's American and telling stories of today. There's, there are so many operas being written that are telling stories of today. Um, I have a, a friend who's an opera composer, and she's like, I don't see a need to ever write anything that is not an environmental story. Um, so, like, yes. Verity and Mozart and all of those people are wonderful, and that's not all that opera is. Yeah. <laughs> recommendation list for after. All right, yeah. Um, other questions? Okay, well, oh, no, no. Thank you all for being with us. It, it means so much to have you here. And, oh, question. yeah, great. <laughs>
What was the question? A bus named the sour grape. Yeah. A book. A book named the sour grape. Okay, I'm gonna put it on my reading list. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, we're just going to ask a couple of questions about how, uh, how this piece came together and, and uh, the experience of putting it together. Um, so we're going to actually start with Kenji. Um, so Kenji, this is your first opera. Congratulations. Um, yeah, congrats. Um, uh, as we were putting the opera together, I remember you talking about um, when you were composing that you would imagine and visualize the stage while you were composing. And now that you're actually sitting on the stage where your opera happened, how, how, did, how does this feel? Uh... It's really difficult to describe in words. Uh, it's like you have fantasy in your head and suddenly your fantasy in front of you. And can you explain how you feel about it? It's, it's like that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was surreal and thrilling. Absolutely, thank you. Um, to, to, is this kind of how you imagine the stage to, to feel? <laughs> oh, I, I can say yes. Yep. But it, it's really great and it's really different than I yep. imagined okay. in a new way. Excellent. Um, to Kelly, um, this story really balances the light and dark of our world in, in a really beautiful way. Um, in your own words, uh, from, from, I think it was from your program, next perhaps, you said that the loving relationship between Yoshiro and his great-grandson, Mume, shines like a lamp against a dark backdrop. Tell us about how you balance these, all these aspects of the story, um, particularly in a production like this that's for all ages, how you sort of pull those things together. Well, it's interesting. I mean, Yoshiro, like those of us in the audience, Yoshiro knows what has been lost, you know, he, and he thinks about, well, when I was a kid, you could lie in the grass, and now we're in a world where, of course, you can't have a picnic outdoors, you know, so there is that darkness, and we see that darkness from our place, we see a world that um, is changed for the worse, um, so there is that heaviness, and I think we, we want this to be a cautionary tale and show that darkness, but the wonderful thing is that Mume does not know the past. You know, he has not seen this decline in the same way. Every day is new. Um, and Yoshiro appreciates and wants to cultivate that quality for him. So, um, so you have a minute already this, this heaviness because of, of what has happened over time. And you have this lightness of someone who is um, meeting each day with fresh eyes. And then you also have the emissary association, who um, is subversively saying, you know what, things could be different. Yes, you know, no one wants to talk about what's gone on. Um, things are really bad, but we're going to try. And we're going to do what we can. Uh, so I think you know, the the light and dark is very much embedded in the novel, and um, you know, I can't really take any credit other than just saying, like, okay, these are these great things about the novel. Let me make sure that I balance both of them. Absolutely. And in the panel conversation that led last night with um, two amazing uh, youth actors from, from the Bay Area, um, I was amazed how they really latched on to the, the special circumstances and really sort of what that meant for, for them um, as a youth now. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how you interpreted the special circumstances and, and what, what, how, what, sort of divide, what role that played in, as a device in, in the story? Sure, and I'll, I'll just say, you know, I'm sorry you all missed last night and these wonderful youth activists. We'll be on that website. Great, that Daniel brought in. I mean, you know, they, they, they were so passionate. And I asked them, uh, because they, they both uh, devote a lot of time to activism. So I said, okay, so what if this was your world? What would you, what would you attack first? Um, and they, they just had no use for these people who were like, shh, shh, don't talk about it. Special circumstances. They were like, I would go to those guys first and, and like, let's talk about these sort of special circumstances. Um, it's interesting, they're not named in the novel. This is one of the many places where Kenji and I have different, um, different reads on it. That's one of the great things about the novel is that you can read it many different ways. My read was, this was very much a, like, we don't talk about bad things um, and that we, maybe we don't 
talk about how bad things are in Japan, and we certainly don't talk about how lack of care for the environment got us in that this mess. That was my read. Ken, do you want to share yours? Yeah, the, the special circumstances. I wanted to ask the audience what you Good. thought <laughs> what it was. <laughs> oh, like bomb. It was the atomic bomb. Yeah. There are no wrong answers, by no the way. No wrong answers. Anyone else have an interpretation of the special circumstances? Just shout it out if you have one. I thought maybe it had to do with Japanese war crimes, not necessarily the bomb, because there's this talk about the Japanese mistakes, and because of that, we're isolated. As if, yeah. As if, I don't know. We, we, we had the text that, that say about fallout mm -hmm. in the opera, and uh, also the Japan did something really, 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 really bad. <laughs> really, really great. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Yeah, it implies that too. And th there is a lot of special songs. And the weird thing for me in my head was the, the most avoided topic of everything. The death. And in my version of this world, Suiren and Mumen is in the hospital already. And Yoshiro is writing about them, the story for them. So sad. But we wanted to make it ambiguous, so the, the dark side and hopefulness to, to be, become an I'm going to jump over to Caitlin. Hi. Um, so this is actually your third production with Dr. Parallel. You're a veteran of the company. Congratulations. Um, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, and this is the second time you've been part of a hands-on opera project. You were uh, in uh, Harriet's Spirit a few years ago with us as well. Um, so tell us about the experience of being part of these, these productions and uh, what's been the most exciting thing about putting the opera together for you. And, okay, um, well I think that, so starting with you know our first production, The Little Prince, and the second Harriet's Spirit, I think all of the productions have made me uh, really see opera in a new light. I mean, I've been part of a chorus, so music has always been a part of my world, but being actually in opera productions has definitely made opera feel more you know, relatable and uh, like relevant to my life, which I think is so important um, for young people to be involved in opera um, and think they can be part of that. This uh, production specifically, um, now I'm pieces to conductor of my school's uh, choir, so I'm sort of seeing, um, I guess, Nicole and Jacob's job in a new light, which has been really interesting to notice more what they're doing as conductors and as directors. Um, so yeah. That's great. Thank you. What do you think the special circumstances are? <laughs> oh, I was, um, uh, I was, yeah, was I had a similar interpretation as you, like, um, just like, oh, things that, you know, we can't talk about it because, um, like avoiding the topic because it's too bad, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Do not want to address it. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna jump down, down the end to Yo-Yo. Uh, Yo -Yo, this was your uh, directorial debut with Opera Parallel. Um, so congratulations. But, uh, you've worked with the company as a choreographer before, but you also have an extensive career as a choreographer and your own dance company as well. Um, so how have you brought that experience of, of choreography and movement into this world of the, the opera production? You know, when I first started working in opera in 2015, I was, I was stunned because I was like, oh, of course there's sheet music, but I didn't think about how movement was tied to that. And so I went back to work at ODC and I was like, why can't we have sheet music for all of our practices? You know, because then we wouldn't, as dancers, have to argue about, oh no, this movement, that passe is on count four and, not, you know. <laughs> and, then, and then there's this other thing where we count like crazy as dancers, right? Like we count up to eight, we don't count measures, and then, you know, we also count, like, you know, just weird. We count up to 23 sometimes from a specific, like, tambourine bell. And so it's, it's interesting for me to work in this context where I can be very specific. I can be very specific about what movement happens where. And as a dancer, I'm really curious about what, how movement reads. You know, I think gestures, I think our bodies hold a you know, we all understand our bodies as human beings, and so it's really fun to be in this other embodied practice. 
where we get to see singers and bodies move on stage to music that can have and develop different meanings. When we were talking a little bit more about the, some of the musical influences that, that came into the piece or that inspired you for the piece, um, I was fascinated about some of the, the street sounds of Japan that you that, uh, incorporated or that inspired some of the melodies in this piece from like traffic lights and uh, food vendors around Japan. Could you tell us more about that and how, uh, how we saw that in the, in the piece today? Uh, yes, so this story is future Japan, right? So I wanted to incorporate, incorporate culture and sound in Japan and I used this traffic light melody. Someone might have heard of it from anime or something. It starts slightly off bit. And I, I think this traffic light express some sense of totally totalitarianism. Hmm. So I use this feeling to the uh, melody and harmony to the lines and text that inco incorporate with that kind of thing, like environmental adaptation and these things. Mm -hmm. And also the market scenes, th these melody are from actually ramen stands melody. In Japan, there's a ramen stands in night around station. Then blowing this double reed instrument called charumera. And that melody of the marketing, this melody was from this charumera melody. This is kind of like the ice cream trucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, that, which, I wish there were ramen, ramen trucks or like ramen stands walking around the streets, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, there are so many sounds that sell food and stuff, like uh, stone, stone baked sweet potato, yakimo. Yakimo. Oigo. Yakimo. This vendor yeah. sing this while they, you know, drive to their truck selling potato. <laughs> <laughs> that, that had a sense of cold winter. Of what? Cold winter. Right, right, right. Yeah. It takes you to that time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, my next question I'm actually going to ask to both Yagoe and Hayden, um, as, as creators and, and cast members of this, this production. Um, so what do you think that adults can learn from the students in this production? What, what can you take away from how they've worked on this piece and how they've uh, put themselves in this piece? And I'd love to ask you the same question. It's also inspired by a little bit of what happened last night in our panel discussion. Um, I actually, I really wanted to ask one of the kids, like, what's the best way to make adults listen? Because I think that's what it really takes. You know, this young climate activist is saying that the most important part of um, act, the climate justice would be decolonization. And, and I still believe in that. And I think it's, it, it relates to imperialism. I think it relates to kind of our, our, our problematic kind of practices. And so, yeah, Kaden, how do you get, when do adults listen to you? That's what I want to know. Um, let's see. Uh, I would say that uh, when adults listen to you is, I mean, you have to make them listen, essentially. Like, uh, you can't just, as a young person, you can't just expect people to immediately listen, that you have to sort of earn your place in the room, I guess. That maybe that's not ideal, but that's how it works. So, um, being there, being ready, being informed um, is all you can do, and just keep insisting that people listen to you, essentially. And, and, you know, keep having sort of fresh eyes on the situation because, I mean, we say so much like, oh, kids are the future, but, I mean, we really are, like, so, <laughs> we really are, so you have to remember that and do something with that. Thank you. Um, so we have one little quickfire question uh, for everyone and then we'll open up for some questions for the audience. Um, it's a bit of a big 
big question for a quick fire question, but I'd love to know what is your hope for the future in terms of environment and in the message from this, this story, what is your hope for the future? Yeah, we'll start with the audience on the end. Sorry. <laughs> that we let our kids lead this. Lead us. Yeah. We have the hope here. That's the hope. Your hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, not just me, everyone. <laughs> I mean, you took my answer. But you know, the, the other side of that is we say, let the kids lead us. That also implies that we've got, we have to follow. Yeah. Um, it's not just, it's not just up to them. Um, but they, they probably have fresher ideas and we should pay attention. I mean, my hope is that this opera, it's a beautiful opera, but my hope is that it doesn't come to pass, that it is a cautionary tale, that the world never gets to a place that, you know, children are, well, maybe not necessarily children are dying, but you know, that the environment is that uh, destroyed. So, I don't know, my hope is that we can make a change now instead of 50 years too late. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so, any, any questions from the audience? Yes, it's John Who chose Cancerry as being the topic for this album? Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, could you, uh, we, could you share some ideas of the topics and themes that uh, you wanted to explore in his piece? And uh, we, we, we sort of did some research on different different areas, and climate fiction was, was the was sort of genre that we discovered, which we didn't even know that was a thing, or cli fi is <laughs> what it's called. Um, yeah, did you want to share your moment? Yeah, I was having a hard time to pick the topic for this bit of the first opera for me. So, it took so long and he sent me a list of recommended books. <laughs> and one of them was Emissary, the Emissary. And the, I remember that the uh, original book, Kento Jit in Japanese, was on my reading list. And it was in the decision after he sent me a list. Any more questions? Yes. yes. So I just want to say two things. One, the, I love how this story is set in Tokyo which is, you know, the largest city in Japan, and the implications of that for the rest of the country, mm -hmm. um, considering the state of Tokyo, and you just think about the rest of the country, the more rural parts, what is going on there, and how worse, how much worse it probably is. Right. Um, and also, I just want to ask uh, the director and the um, Kaden, were there coordinating the scooter choreography? Were there collisions? <laughs> 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 Um, well, the the scooter oh, thank you. the scooter choreography is on a supposed to be on a specific measure. <laughs> a specific <laughs> beat, yeah. Just like on the the riding all everyone riding around in the scooters, were there any collisions between? <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not that I saw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. they're, they're very they're very uh, their their generation is very good at scootering. <laughs> So there's a reason I was not pitched to do this. <laughs> I can't scooter. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, two things. One is that I don't have all the Japanese street references that Kenji was getting. What it took me to was the Middle Ages, or maybe even the Dark Ages, when a lot of knowledge either had been forgotten or, in this case, wasn't talked about. So I was on a completely different track. I, I did get the environmental, that there was an environmental disaster and that people couldn't go outdoors. But I was really wondering how the knowledge was going to be recovered. Mm -hmm. And then the second question, I had read the book, I knew nothing about it, was why the only sick child in the cast was chosen to go somewhere else when it seemed that he was dying. Why were, why wasn't, I mean, you, you're not the author, I know, so you're dealing with what you started with, but for me it made no sense. <laughs> one, of, one of the tricky things I think um, when you're adapting a novel for a, a 50 minute piece is um, you can't always put in the detail, but actually in some way or another, no child is, is extremely healthy. Um, and so, you know, no, no child is extremely helpful. So you're, 
you're not, um, your perception is correct. It, the, the idea is they want to send a sick child, actually. Um, and this went by quite fast. They say, we want to send our, our children so that people can see what's happening to our children. So they want to send a sick child to be studied. Um, so that's. Because that was the next question. What was he supposed to accomplish? Yeah, the, the idea of um, to send a child across the sea so they can see what's happening to our children, a message and map, like a cautionary tale. Because Japan is closed, in theory, no one knows how bad it is, so they want to send a child um, to be studied before it's But corollarily, you don't know if the rest of the world is in just as bad or worse shape. That's true. <laughs> you know, I thought the book was, the book ending is so interesting. I don't want to ruin it, but it's, it's a little open, it's yeah. very open. Um, and what I can say about it without giving, without, you know, what is it called when you make it? Spoiler. Spoiler. But like, um, it's so interesting because, I, I don't think I need a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's fascinating because there's, there's so, so many things happen and, and there's actually so many questions. And, and one of the, the things is like, you know, you get to choose. Does, is there some sort of extraction? Is it, is it an extraction into outer space, into a different galaxy? You know, Mume is having this conscious moment of losing gender, um, feeling the warm sand, and, and so part of our, or, you know, when I was thinking about, you know, does he die? I mean, that could be an option in the story, but it was really important to think, for me, about, you know, when I, when I think of going through something hard, and I get stuck there, I can't get through it. And so it was really important to me to stage something where the child actually gets through to the other side, and that's what I was kind of hoping to do with the staging. I have time for one more question. Yes? Yeah, you started to talk about it in different ways, but I'm interested just in general. As you said, it's a 50-minute piece, and there's obviously a lot of threads that were dropped or consolidated. I'm interested to hear like, what, are, what are some decision points that you made through that process of things that you either focus more on or focus less on as part of the adaptation process? Well, the first thing is to, to figure out how to tell a story beginning to end and, and you know, kind of get the spine of the piece. Um, but then you also start having questions about musical variety, like how do you make this enjoyable as an opera? And there is always that question for me, um, why is it an opera? Why are people singing? What are the scenes where music can add something to the storytelling? So I feel like I have decent instincts about that. I usually make a first pass, and then I hand it to my composer, um, who may say, that's, that, like, that's, I, I don't have enough ideas for that, but this scene is really important. Um, and so I had that kind of exchange with Kenji. Um, one of the scenes that was not in early on, and I'm so glad that he said, you, you have to put this in, uh, was the memory with the hot pot. You know, arguably, like, we don't have to have that memory, that vision of the grandmother to, to get the plot from beginning to end, but it ended up being, I thought, just for the energy of the piece, and certainly for that beautiful music you wrote, so important. So, um, you know, you start with the skeleton, and then it's like, well, what else? What else is going to make the piece work? Very much a collaborative effort. The, the one biggest thing we talked about that we, at the beginning was how to make this opera ambiguous like the novel. Yeah, the novel has, a, has an ambiguous ending, and we both had a, a different read on the ending the first time. And I think that's intentional on Nova to part. And one of, one of the things you could do in writing an opera is say, well, it's a family opera, it's 15 minutes, it should be simple, let's choose one and build toward that. But instead, we said, how can we build this so that someone could have Kenji's first read and someone could have my first read? And the, maybe this answers the previous question, too. And in my head, I told you that the Sweden and Mume is actually in the hospital and Yoshiro is writing. And at the opera, Yoshiro throw away the novel, his last novel, too many foreign names. And this book is actually this opera, and he's writing about his lost roommate and his life in hospital, and make it fancy ending for him. 
That's why sex kiss goes to the other side. Okay, thanks so much. I think that's all we have time for now. But thank you.